So good morning, everyone. I guess it's the last day of the conference and uh, the last few sessions. Very nice to see so many of you staying back. So thanks for doing that. Uh, I guess from a conference standpoint, it's been very interesting. A lot of relevant uh, topics, great speakers, and a great opportunity to network. So I'll probably start with the core theme of the conference, which is really about digital, right? So everyone's kind of emphasized this. I'll probably give a few trends here. So we've seen 2017 as the year where internet advertising exceeded television uh, spends. It was a great uh, inflection point. We're also seeing a case where this year, close to 60% of all B2C retail sales will be influenced by digital. And we're already seeing that a third of these retail sales are being now influenced by mobile. And mobile is just kind of just begun, if you will. We're also seeing this sort of acceleration amongst B2B companies, right? So we've all heard of Granger at 60%, plans to get to 80% by 2022. MSC is already at that 60% mark, looking at companies like Robert Bosch investing in IoT startups. So just like electricity is a source to this bulb, we're increasingly seeing that data and analytics can be that source to drive better decisions, to improve customer experience, revenue and margins. And what I'm going to do today is probably take you through three examples. Uh, one around e-commerce product content, one around data-driven pricing, and the third is around better product range decisions. So I'll, I thought I'll start with the, the product content piece because it's been a very hot topic here. And just to reiterate and repeat this message that's been said so many times over, this is from Forrester Research, right? So they said that when they surveyed their buyers, their B2B buyers, they clearly said that they want credible product details. That's a very, very important uh, you know, piece of information that they're looking for in order to make a buying decision. I think that product information is very similar to product availability in the times of store retail. So if I don't have a product available in the store, I can't make a sale. I think product information is as important because it drives search, it helps engagement, it helps make the sale, improve market share, improve your margins, and obviously improve the productivity of the sales teams. But the question is, how do we know what are the gaps in our product content? How do we know that this is the type of product content that the customer is really looking for? So having worked with a lot of B2C retailers, uh, what we've helped some of them do is take an objective view of what sort of product content do you have there? How does that compare with your competitors? So what you see here, hopefully it's not an eye test, uh, is on the bottom right, you see that Zap East Bay, for example, has an opportunity to improve their keywords, right? Now, this sort of a content audit makes it very objective to make decisions, especially when you look at the, the whole nine yards. You look at, you know, you can understand what are the gaps from a product title standpoint, features, attributes, image, videos. You can compare that across your... Uh, your competitors or channel partners. So most recently, we started doing this for a large manufacturer. So this manufacturer wants to understand, when I look at the customer journey of awareness, consideration, and purchase, help us understand how does our, how does our product content stack up across you know, specific points. Like if I take basic content, how are we doing from a title standpoint? How are we doing across certain parameters in SEO? How are we doing when it comes to conversion? Can you kind of make it objective and put a score out there? And then can you help us track this score over time? Can you then help us understand how is this score doing vis-a-vis -vis our channel providers? So that we can, that is their business development or e-commerce teams can have objective discussions with their partners to say, you need to make these changes and these are the specific areas that you need to be making these changes. Now the good part is, okay, we've got all of this measurement and you've kind of found the gaps. How about fixing these gaps, right? So in this particular example, as you'll see, one of our customers had one on the left-hand side, their A plus content, which is kind of the before state. When we kind of fix this, you'll see there are a lot of opportunities to make sure you have enriched and short and specific descriptions. You need to have updated feature and benefits, which weren't there, uh, updated SEO, friendly keywords. I guess all of you have been speaking about this. The right type of long descriptions. 
make sure you have specifics around product applications, right? Uh, how should the product be used, usage instructions. And very important to have these specifications A, enriched, but also arranged in the right order of importance. And somebody just spoke about consistency, right? How do we make it consistent across the experience, across products, across geographies? And obviously, not to forget important things like disclaimers. Now let's say you, we found these gaps, we fixed these gaps, so what's the impact, right? So before getting to the impact, it's extremely important to make sure that we have a measurement framework. So for, for example, for this client, we have this measurement framework, and you will see that we started to include product uh, metrics or product information metrics alongside web metrics. So you're looking at text fill ratios or marketing text fill ratios, uh, image fill rates, alongside, let's say, web revenue, offline revenue, page visits, et cetera. So that you're trying to truly understand what's the impact of uh, you know, having this information. So if you have high fill rates, does that increase traffic? Does that have a longer time on page? Does that impact uh, uh, visits and so on and so forth? And in this particular example, we've seen that this particular client saw a 10% increase in conversion. They spent a lot of time with us doing a very exhaustive analysis because you can, you know, you can use uh, data to tell a story that you're looking for. But if you use the right methodology, you can truly understand what sort of lift did you get. I thought what was very heartening was the qualitative comment that the client made, saying that we are now moving away from a gut-based or an opinion-based uh, method of saying, you know, this is the change we need to make. We should have five images. To a situation where we now have a data-driven capability to make these content interventions or improvements. So moving to the second uh, example, this is around data-driven pricing. So this is a client of ours which is a large uh, distributor of industrial parts. Uh, they have over 600 manufacturers on one side and a fragmented set of retailers on the other side. So they've been working, they had been working about two years ago with a consulting company that had come and implemented a out-of-the-box pricing solution for them. And we had been doing some uh, cross-referencing work for them to improve their bid productivity. And they said, okay, we have a price optimization problem. They said, great, okay, what do you want to optimize? Uh, they said, you know, our pricing is a black box. I said, what do you mean by a black box? I'm sure if you're on the other side of the client, it's extremely annoying, right? Going through these set of questions. Uh, but digging deeper in, we found that there are certain symptoms here. The client's retailers, basically those retailers, they're going crazy. Their sales team is going crazy. The pricing team is going crazy. But our client kept still saying that we need to optimize pricing. So I guess clients are always right. You have to kind of listen to them very carefully. But going deeper into the trenches, here's what we found was happening. So they had a whole host of customers, right? And those customers would buy uh, a lot of their products from certain vendors. And there was a fairly complex black box pricing model which had 34 types of discounts that would be thrown out and you'd arrive at a final price. So the sales guy then has to deliver this final price to the client, and uh, he or she is unable to answer specific questions as to why is the discount this much, or if I increase the volume by so much, how much discount can you give me? So as, a, as you see, there would be a lot of back, back and forth between the client, the sales team, and the pricing team. And as a result of all this back and forth, the solution was exceptions in pricing, right? which just tend to complicate the matter. So what was done in this case was to really optimize and simplify the pricing into you know, just three discount buckets, right? Make sure that the sales team not only gets this for a margin neutral option, but gets an ability to have manual intervention so they can make the changes, they can look at the impact or assessment of this so that they can have interactions with their clients to say, okay, if you increase this volume, this is a discount, right? Or they can answer those questions. And what we've seen, this is now about maybe six months that we've kind of implemented this. It's very heartening to see that um, this sort of a feedback from the client, especially saying that despite this major change, there has been very little noise from their customers. Right? So they're keeping the margin neutral as it was in the old pricing system, but taking out a lot of this complexity out of it. So if you ask me, I really don't think it's a price optimization problem as much as primarily a price simplification problem. 
And then moving on to the, to the last example, which is around better product range decisions. So this is an example from a from very large B2C home improvement retailer. So they do what's called as product line reviews or range reviews. And this helps them obviously understand what sort of assortment should I keep, carry, drop, what should I be uh, carrying in my store, what should I carry online, and so on and so forth. But the way they would go about synthesizing this information or trying to arrive at this decision was very manual. It was very complex. So as a result, they would only do a few categories every year. Uh, it was not fast enough, it was very error prone, and very little or limited insights. Now to add to that, the other problem was their method was slightly backward looking. So when they were trying to make these decisions, how would they go about deciding what assortment to keep, carry, or drop? Look at past sales. If wherever available, look at syndicated data. Talk to suppliers and use their gut. But we've seen a tremendous growth, thanks to digital, of consumer signals and competitive information. So today you're able to understand what's the Google search signal for this product, how many reviews, ratings, social signals, and so on and so forth. So you're getting some sort of e-signals or consumer intent for certain products. And you're also getting a sense of competitive prices, availability, and so shipping times, et cetera. So what we've been doing for them, and in this, just to give you a sense of scale, this is a million SKUs on a daily basis across 30 competitors and 4,500 zip locations or store locations. So how do you kind of blend all of this together and make meaning out of this? So in order to do this, a very, very important piece is to be able to match these products. So we kind of have to extract all this information or attributes from products and use sophisticated machine learning algorithms that then come back and say that this particular paintbrush is very similar to the first one, or it's not very similar to the last one. As you see, there's a small number 86 to number 82. Because once we're able to make these matches, it's very useful to say, hey, this is a national brand, it's a similar one, this is a private label, uh, sorry, that's an exact one, or private label, this is a similar one. Because when we're able to make those matches, you're able to then get very good insights at a skew level you're able to say, if I take this particular SKU, help me understand what's the price architecture across competitors. Help me understand the, let's say, other elements versus my internal sales or across, in this case, how are we doing across, uh, how are competitors talked across uh, various store locations, right? So, as you can see, there are a whole host of applications to use data and analytics to ask, answer business questions, right? So they could be around channel, they could be around campaign performance, customer analytics. Uh, many of you have been speaking about improving marketing allocation, spends, demand planning, bid productivity, sales performance, and so on and so forth. But what's really coming in the way? It's this. Right, so I'm sure a lot of you had a lot of this last night. Uh, but what I really mean in this is, if you look at it, the, the bottleneck in a bottle is always on the top. And sometimes it's called leadership. Right? So what we're seeing is many of these companies have a situation where, yeah, and my boss is right here, so. <laughs> <coughs> um, so they're actually either busy or they have some other priorities. They're unable to really commit to some of these exercises. Or there are situations where org structures have been coming in the way, incentive structures have been coming in the way. Some companies, while they have all of that, they've not had too many success cases. You know, so nobody wants to really bell the cat. We've also seen cases where they lack expertise. How do we deal with this? They lack resources. And I think across most organizations, what we see is data is all over the place. I guess data is in silos, infrastructure is kind of broken. Now, I think the, the good part about this bottle is turning it upside down, right? Uh, making sure we get to consume what's inside that. And we strongly believe that data and analytics can really, really be deployed in the right manner to help companies do a better job in driving better business performance. So that's it from me, guys. Uh, thanks so much for your listening.